thank you for your patience. Uh, we are being streamed, so I've just got to wait for the go ahead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues, um, members of the press, a special welcome to our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Systems and Operations, Professor Ian Janrell. Welcome, colleagues, friends to Wits University in the year of our centenary. Welcome to this magnificent planetarium dome, which is just a little bit more than uh, 60 years old this year. A special welcome uh, to the Head of Physics and thanks uh, Professor Dina Naidu for hosting us here at the, uh, at the planetarium, which is a part of the School of Physics, and also to fellow astronomers and collaborators. Special thanks to uh, Mrs. Sharona Patel and the excellent team at, uh, at uh, Communications for helping arrange this magnificent uh, event today. Colleagues, a warm welcome to our discussion.
all the dozens and bits to, to be at Sutherland. In neighboring Namibia, uh, we have the world's largest gamma ray uh, telescope, um, but, but uh, this would be would, um, a, a more powerful next generation such telescope is currently being built in, in Chile. And what is, what is of great excitement currently in South Africa is the, the Mirka telescope that has been built in the Northern Cape. This is the precursor to this regular meteor ray, and of course Roger is this is, as I mentioned, an SKA research chair here at our own School of Physics. And uh, <coughs> this is located in, a, in an area that is legislated to be radio, radio quiet in terms of the frequency bands <coughs> that are relevant for radio astronomy in, um, in South Africa. <coughs> so, so Meerkat and SK is operating in an area that is protected by the government and therefore uh, in terms of radio, radio frequency interference and therefore becomes a very ideal location for, for the co-location of, of various other radio telescopes. And it's in this context that I would like to uh, support Roger's call for South Africa hosting a next generation event horizon telescope uh, satellite station observing station right here in South Africa. So these various different stations are located in all countries other than in s Southern Africa and it would be very, very uh, helpful. It would be very beneficial for South African astronomy if we can have this uh, located. And Roger, please call on my fullest support and help for us to get this through to, to get government support uh, for, for such, a, such a construction. I don't think that that would be terribly terribly expensive. It's just about a 15 meter class uh, radio telescope, single dish. So, so this would be very beneficial for Wits University because much of this work uh, using the Event Horizon Telescope uh, Array is, is led by, by uh, our own Roger Dean. So there's much exciting work to be done in imaging a black hole. The very first uh, image was, was produced in 2019. And uh, Roger was a part of the international collaboration that uh, produced the 2020 Nobel Prize that was awarded to Genzel and Gez. Both of them have uh, affiliations in, in California, I know, and, and one of those individuals worked out of Munich. Uh, and, and that uh, Nobel Prize, together with Roger Penrose, who has a long association with South Africa, um, w was for the discovery of, of a super supermassive uh, compact object at the center of our, of our galaxy. And today, of course, Roger is going to be talking more about the technical scientific details for the research that has, has been pursued since then on the imaging of that, uh, of that uh, supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, referred to as Sagittarius uh, A star. I think the star is part of the name. So colleagues, it is my pleasure. You've come here to listen to Roger, not myself. I'm the Dean of Science. Uh, Roger is the scientist. Uh, I, I call upon Roger Dean then to tell us more about his exciting research. Come through, please, Roger. Well, thank you very much to the Dean of Science. Can we do an audio check? It seems like you guys are still solving some problems there. Are we good? Um, can I ask one of the tech team to move the podium again? And while we Thank you very much again to the Dean of Science. Um, we're very privileged at Wits University that we have a, 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 dean of, a Dean of Science that is so well versed, as you just heard, uh, with the South African national uh, astronomy landscape. And we're, we're very, very appreciative of your continued support for, for Wits Astronomy and, and the Gauteng region in general. Right. Thank you very much, guys. So we, as, you, as you can tell, we've had some technical issues. Um, and so the idea of this pre-presentation to the main event, which is streaming from, from Munich, is to just be, give you a primer uh, and a refresh for, for those that might not, um, uh, cast their minds back to 2019 and the Event Horizon Telescope first result. Just give you a sense of you know, what, what the array is, who we are as a collaboration, and, and how the, the technique works. Um, as you'll see, this is very much on behalf uh, of the entire Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, um, but also I've put um, Dr. Indian Natarayan, Witt's postdoctoral fellow funded by, by, by my Sereo um, chair um, in, in radio astronomy, and he's played a, an incredibly important part of the, the results that are being announced today. Um, a very, very talented uh, young Witsi. 
we um, we have about seven minutes until the the live stream from from Munich. So I'm going to take you on a on a very quick tour of what the EAP is. This will be a quick primer, uh, about half the length that it was supposed to be, and then we'll move to the main event, which is the announcements of these of these results uh, from the Milky Way, and then we'll come back in here or a few more um, contextualize the South African contribution and speak to some of the, uh, the, the connections to the South African uh, astronomy landscape and then also speak to what, what Nithya mentioned is the, um, the potential African expansion of the Event Horizon Telescope with which we have an incredible geographic advantage. Right, so who is the EHT? Well, this is back in 2018, just before the first image was released. We've, we've not had that many collaboration meetings since uh, in person, but we're looking forward to our first one. Um, well, uh, the first one in, in quite some time in, in Spain in a few weeks, in, in a month's time. Um, but as you can see, there are over 300 researchers, 80 institutes, four continents, and myself and Dr. Natarayan from the Witz Postdoctoral Fellow, only two who are based on African soil. So we wanted to have this satellite um, press conference just to give some of that local um, context, uh, it, both from, the, from, from South Africa and the continent. So this is where um, our researchers are based and telescopes. You can, this is included in the press pack for the, for the press, so you'll be able to go to this Google map. Um, it's important to mention the 13 stakeholder institutes that make considerable uh, the majority of the financial contributions to the individual telescopes that make up the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and then we have the affiliated institutes, um, and you'll see some of the South African uh, institutes uh, uh, on, on there. And then very importantly, um, funding is also contributed to the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration through the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory um, and the National Research Foundation. So we're very grateful for that. Um, this is the what. Uh, the array of the, the network is um, an array of antennas ac spread across the Earth. Um, and what's, what's important to note about this, those that are perhaps more familiar with the square kilometer array or Meerkat, is that this array observes at a, wa a wavelength of light of one millimeter. And one millimeter, uh, so the EHT sits up there. The, arm that you're seeing there is essentially just telling you how much the atmosphere is absorbing your 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 wavelength of light if you're on, at sea level so our challenge is that we have to move to high altitude in order to um, get close as space as possible uh, to observe wavelengths of light per meter um, so we go to some pretty extreme sites uh, you can see the south pole in the bottom right there um, Volcanoes on top of um, <laughs> volcanoes in Hawaii um, to Chile, uh, a host of very very extreme sites. If you want to get as close to space as possible, well, these are some of the sites that you have to go to. Um, it's very an important point is this is not a digital camera that you simply point and shoot. Um, there's a technique which we can come back to, but I just want to, as I say, uh, this is a primer. Um, essentially, you can think of this array not as individual telescopes or as one telescope, but as handshakes between telescopes. Think of it as pairs of antennas. Um, so this is the, the very large array in, in New Mexico, um, in the United States. And think of those as handshakes. So if we all shook each other's hands in the room, how many handshakes would there be? And a radio interferometer like the EHT makes those handshakes many, many times a second, and we collect off those measurements. We do not take photographs. We invert those measurements to become uh, an image. I need to move along now because we're getting very close to the, the main event. Um, but another key point here is the, the largest separation you have between these antennas tells you how sharp the image is that you can make. Um, so further apart, sharper images. Um, so that's the array, one million wavelength of light being observed, a thousand times better, sharper images than the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is what we use to try and image supermassive black holes. Um, so you'll be seeing a bit of the intro on this in a moment from Munich, um, but essentially there are um, uh, supermassive holes that have an accretion disk, that is matter that's swirling in and, and falling in, and they sometimes shoot out these jets, and that's what you can see in the gray and vertical. 
we are, um, we'll come back to this in terms of what the shadow is, but the two concepts I want to convey before the, the press conference is um, the matter, uh, light being captured by the black hole and light being sort of appears to be bent by the black hole. And, and the combination of those two things will result in, well, predicted to, and we, we made the first image back in 2019 of this ring-like structure of the external environment of a black hole where you've got very, very hot plasma, billion de degree plasma, um, and the appearance of that comes together as a, as a ring-like uh, figure. And, and, and that's what the Event Horizon Telescope attempts to image with two, two primary black holes. Uh, it's important to note that these shadows, we call them shadows, evolve over time and they they're different depending on your position angle your inclination of the black hole um, we'll come back to that in a moment but in a nutshell you've got a rotating earth with a network of antennas observing wavelengths of light of one millimeter pointed at very very hot plasma in the immediate vicinity of supermassive black holes that's that's what we're doing here and with that i think i should move over to the um to the live stream please Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here in Garching, Germany, at the headquarters of the European Southern Observatory, or ESO for short. Thank you to everyone uh, watching us online as well. Today, we'll be hearing from the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration about their newest results, so please do switch off your mobile phones to hear them. I'm Barbara Freire, I'm the media manager at ESO, and since we don't have much time until the main results go live in multiple press conferences around the world, I'll quickly present the format of today's event. First, we will hear from ESO's Director General, Xavier Barcones, uh, and then from lead um, Event Horizon Collaboration Scientists about the main research. We'll then open the floor for questions from journalists only, be it those here in the room or those watching remotely. I will now hand over to Xavier to open the proceedings. Thank you. Good afternoon. Warm welcome to ESO to everyone. It's really great pleasure to be here today hosting the members of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration as they prepare to announce their most anticipated results following the unveiling of the first image of a black hole back in 2019. Today we're going to see something really new, exciting, extraordinary at the center of our galaxy for the first time. We've been so close to it many times before. ESO facilities like the Very Large Telescope and the VLT Interferometer, in addition to the Keck telescopes in the US, have observed stars moving around the compact invisible object at the heart of the Milky Way. And for sure, uh, the ESO Extremely Large Telescope will continue doing this in the future towards the end of the decades. The movements of these stars have been tracked for decades using specially crafted instrumentations. These measurements offer the best and very solid evidence so far that these stars can only be orbiting a supermassive black hole. Reinhard Gensel, who is with us today, thank you very much for joining us, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize back in 2020 together with Andrea Gies in the US for exactly this discovery. But we are yet to see direct visual evidence of this compact object, which astronomers call Sagittarius A star. This extraordinary result would not have been possible to achieve by one single facility or even by the national astronomical community of a single country. It took eight radio observatories around the world and that network 
that network has already expanded to 11 today. Many built, funded, operated, and supported through international organizations across many countries around the world. Among those, ALMA and APEX in the Atacama Desert of Chile, which are co-owned and co-operated by ESO, as well as European facilities like the IRAM 30 meter telescope in Pico Veleta and the NOEMA uh, array in the French Alps. It also involves an international team of about 300 scientists, plus many others supporting them, like engineers and many more people. And altogether, it shows what we can achieve when we cooperate, when we work together. This is very important to remember in the times that we are living in, where uh, the world is not running in that direction, unfortunately. ESO was founded 60 years ago precisely to foster international cooperation in astronomy so we can jointly tackle uh, the biggest open questions in the universe. And indeed, the key motivation for ESO to put its, tel its telescopes in the southern hemisphere was to enable science to be done around the center of the Milky Way. But this is why it's such a big pleasure today uh, to be here hosting this event. Together with me, I have two of the leading figures of the collaboration, the EHT project director, Hope van Langevelde, chief scientist at JIVE and also professor at Leiden University, and the founding chair of the EHT board, Anton Zensus, director of the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. Anton will later be telling us about the European facilities involved in the EHT, and now uh, Hub will now present the main result. So, over. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Javier. Uh, when I entered the field of radio astronomy as a student, I was told about this enigma, this mysterious radio source, ZJ star, at the heart of our galaxy. I observed it at long wavelengths, and there it appears to be blurred. It's very exciting here today to show you today this best ever image of that enigma, ZJ star. I will do that by, uh, with my team, or with the team. Um, but I would first like to remind you that the team is much bigger than fits in this audience. In fact, it's bigger than fits in the uh, auditoria uh, around the world where this press event is taking place simultaneously. We are over 300 people on these papers and uh, only very few of us get to be staged here today uh, to share the result with you. Um, to share the result, we will be flying into the heart of the galaxy some 27,000 light years away from us. We will do that in 45 seconds. That's a violation of Einstein right away, but maybe that's probably the only uh, violation of Einstein. So we start out from the plains of, uh, uh, of Chile, where the ALMA telescope is located, and we're going to zoom in to Sagittarius, the archer, which is high in the sky uh, above the, uh, northern Chile. And we will go and zoom in first in the optical, but we have to switch to the infrared because there we can penetrate all the way into the galaxy. We leave tens of millions of stars behind and we get to the place where stars are in orbit about a, around a dark spot. And when we switch then to our radio eyes and we use a network of telescopes to resolve further and further, I can present to you the image of CJ star, black hole at the galactic center. I will, now, I will now introduce my team in reverse order here in, on stage, because that went really fast. Uh, uh, Christian Fromm is from uh, Frankfurt and Wittwerk University. Maria Felicia uh, Laurentis is from the University of Napoli and the it, uh, Italian nuclear, uh, nuclear Research Facility. Jose Luis Gomez is from the uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia in Granada. Uh, Thomas Kriegbaum is from the MPI in Bonn, uh, but to lead on uh, explaining what we have seen and, and what it all means, 
Sarah Isaun is from uh, Harvard and Smithsonian and Radboud University. Thank you, Hub. <laughs> this is the first image of the supermassive black hole at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius A star. For decades, we have known about a compact object that is at the heart of our galaxy that is four million times more massive than our sun. Today, right this moment, we have direct evidence that this object is a black hole. The black hole resides inside the dark region at the center of this image, where its gravitational pull is so strong that light cannot escape and only darkness remains. We call this region the shadow of the black hole. This region is surrounded by very hot gas swirling around the black hole. This gas emits radio waves we observe with the Event Horizon Telescope. These radio waves create the glow we observe around the shadow of the black hole. From our image, we measure the size of the shadow of Sagittarius A star to be 52 micro arc seconds on the sky. This is about the size of a donut on the surface of the moon as seen from Earth. In reality, Sagittarius A star is about as big as the orbit of Mercury around the sun but at a distance of 27,000 light years. Because the size of a black hole shadow is proportional to its mass, our image tells us that the mass of Sagittarius A star is four million times greater than that of our sun. It is really incredible that this prediction from Einstein's theory of general relativity matches the mass measured by the Nobel Prize winning studies of stellar orbits in our galactic center. Today's image might look familiar to some of you. We were all amazed that the image of Sagittarius A star looked so similar to that of the famous black hole in the M87 galaxy, an image our team revealed back in 2019. However, Sagittarius A star is over 1,000 times less massive than M87 star. If Sagittarius A star were the size of this donut right here, tiny, M87 star would be the size of the Allianz Arena, the Munich football stadium just a few kilometers from where we are today. On top of that, Sagittarius A star consumes gas at a much slower rate than M87 star. And these two black holes also reside in completely different environments. Sagittarius A star resides at the center of our small spiral galaxy, whereas M87 star resides at the center of a giant elliptical galaxy and ejects a powerful jet of plasma. Despite all these differences, the images of these two black holes look very similar. Why is that? This similarity reveals to us a key aspect of black holes. No matter their size or the environment they live in, once you arrive at the edge of a black hole, gravity takes over. The journey to the edge of Sagittarius A star spanned decades of technical and scientific developments. And I will pass it on to my colleague Thomas to tell you all about our adventure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Imaging a distant black hole would not have been possible without a big telescope of very high magnifying power or angular resolution, as we astronomers call it. To achieve this, astronomers combine radio telescopes located around the globe to create a super telescope which has the size of the Earth. This technique is called very long baseline interferometry, or short VBI. While the Earth is rotating, all telescopes observe the same astronomical objects for several hours. At each telescope, the data are recorded on hard disks and are accurately time-tagged by precise atomic clocks. 
After observations, the data are shipped to processing centers where they are combined in supercomputers. These supercomputers are called correlators. After a number of quite complex data analysis steps, this results in the high resolution image of the radio source. It took more than 25 years to optimize this observing technique and make it work also in the short wavelengths, one millimeter band, where the angular resolution is highest. It required the development of quite complex and very technically challenging techniques and data acquisitions so that the wider observing bandwidths uh, was, could be used to achieve this better sensitivity. This sensitivity is really needed for the accurate imaging of the faint event horizon scale structures, which we are now seeing in Sagittarius A star. A decade of pilot studies paved the way in Europe and in the US for the formation of the event horizon telescope. The EHT is a VLBI network of telescopes, which combines radio waves at 1.3 millimeter wavelengths. This wavelength is short enough to see the swirling matter around the black hole. During the Sagittarius observations in 2017, the EHT combined eight telescopes. Since then, the network has already grown to 11 nowadays. The radio telescopes of the EHT are located at particularly high sites to minimize the influence on the, of the atmosphere and the water vapor on the observations. Examples are the ALMA and APEX telescope in the dry Atacama Desert in Chile, the IRAM 30 meter telescope in the Sierra Nevada close to Granada in Spain, and the NUEMA interferometer in the French Alps. With this, the EHT, EHT achieves an angular resolution, which is sufficient for the imaging of such distant black holes and also sufficient for the sur matter surrounding these black holes. To give you an idea, the EHT can see three million times sharper than the human eye. So when you are sitting in a Munich beer garden, for example, one could see the bubbles in the glass of beer in New York. Sagittarius A star was observed by the EHT in five observing runs during April 5 to 11 in 2017. These telescopes also included, for example, special places like the South Pole. The telescopes recorded a total of 6,000 terabytes of data, which were then shipped to the two correlator centers, one being in Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn, and the other one at MIT Haystack in Massachusetts, close to Boston in the US. The amount of processed data is really very, very huge. It would basically, if you would print this data on A4 paper, the stack, paper stack would reach the moon. Of course, we are not going to waste such much paper. After correlation, the calibration and sophisticated data analysis took several years and required the development of many, many new tools uh, by the members of the EHT collaboration. In this development, uh, we also honor the substantial contribution of very many young scientists who just start their careers now. For the details of this amazing imaging process, I would like to refer to my colleague and the next speaker, Jose Lu. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Yes, as my colleague Thomas uh, mentioned, the, the, the EHT is like a giant Earth-sized telescope, but it doesn't work like a regular telescope. Instead, the radio telescopes of the EHT work in pairs, with each pair collecting the information required to, to obtain an image. As the Earth rotates, the separation and orientation between, between telescopes changes, providing this extra data that we need. With the eight radio telescopes of the EHT, we have enough information to obtain an image, making the EHT the only existing instrument humanity has to image supermassive black holes. Imaging such a was, however, significantly more challenging than M87. Oh my God, it was really a lot harder. Our line of sight 
to the galactic center is obscured by matter, which scatters radio waves coming from the region around the black hole. But most importantly, as shown in these computer animations, the gas in these two black holes moves at the same speed, nearly as fast as the speed of light. But Sag J star is over 1,000 times smaller than M87. This means that the, uh, the, the time that the gas takes to orbit the Sag J is only just a few minutes, while it takes days to weeks to orbit the larger M87. This means that the gas around Sag J was actually changing while we were observing it. It was like trying to take a clear picture of a running child at night. So you would imagine how difficult and how crazy it drove us for many years. So we EHT scientists has developed sophisticated new tools to account for this rap rapid movement of gas around such a star. Tens of millions of images of synthetic data created to best resemble that of such a star have been produced in supercomputers around the world to refine all algorithms, like searching for the best lens and filter to get the sharpest ever image in your camera. The EHT collaboration has produced thousands of images of Sag J star using classical methods and EHT tailored new algorithms for imaging interferometric data. As shown in these uh, images, each one of these images is slightly different, but by aggregating these images together, we are able to emphasize the common features, finally revealing the giant larkin at the center of our galaxy for the first time. But it is important to note that not all images look alike. We found that we can uh, 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 this, uh, class these images into four different categories. The vast majority of them are contained in three clusters with only ring images that only has some changes in the brightness distribution around the ring, and only just a minor, minor uh, cluster with uh, images that does, doesn't look quite like, uh, like ring images. Through literally years of exhaustive uh, tests, we are now confident to have captured the first image of the black hole in our galactic center. Sag J star now holds the record previously set by M87 of the most thoroughly vetted interferometric image that has ever been made. Our detailed analysis of the images, as well as exhaustive modeling of the interferometric data has revealed that all share exactly the same ring size, precisely measured to be 52 micro seconds, in perfect agreement with the size predicted by prior, prior observations and theory. Of course, we are thrilled today to show the first image of the black hole in our galactic center. This, together with the previously release of an 87 image, it, it fulfills the initial visionary goal of the EHT, but this actually only marks the beginning of an amazing area in the study of black holes. The e ongoing expansion of the EHT and the significant technological upgrades we will allow scientists of the, e of the EHT to release even more amazing images and, of course, movies of black holes in the future. And now to learn what this image tell us about the black hole itself, I pass it on to my colleague Christian. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. To interpret the image and to learn more about black holes, we perform detailed models how the gas and the light behaves in the direct vicinity of black holes. Our models have four ingredients, the black hole, magnetic fields, gas circulating the black hole, and the light emitted by the gas, which is finally collected by the telescopes of the EHT. Astrophysical black holes can be fully described by their mass and their rotation. 
black holes can spin either in the same direction as the gas or in the opposite direction. For the model or for the image and the source in the galactic center, we know the mass estimate very good from stars orbiting it. However, the spin of the black hole in the galactic center is rather unknown. In our models, we let mass and matter fall towards the black hole, and this matter forms a disk around it. The gas in the disk is circulating the black hole and heats up. While the gas is heating up, it starts glowing. So thus, in the EHT image, we see the glow of the infalling and outfalling material. Similar to the black hole spin, we don't know exactly what is the orientation of the black hole towards the Earth. And changes in the orientation lead to different image structure and different positions of the bright spot around the ring. Therefore, our modeling needs to cover a large range of possible spins and inclinations. Therefore, we built the largest and most detailed image library for black holes ever. For this purpose, we use supercomputers around the globe, spending billions of CPU hours creating petabytes of data. Finally, we have obtained millions of black hole images and we compared them not only to the EHT data, but also to historical and complementary data. Our best bet model, which is playing now, shows a lot of fine details. You can see these fine arcs going around the black hole. However, when we consider the resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope, as my colleague explained, these fine features are blurred out. And you will see this soon. This will switch on to the blurred image. So now you see the transition to the blurring. Now the fine features are gone. This is the resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope. What we found is that the black hole in the galactic center is rotating and it's seen phase on. The implications of our modeling with respect to theory of gravity will be explained by my colleague, Maria Felicia. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. As a warnierest supermassive black hole, such a star can be studied in ways that are not possible for other sources, making it a unique laboratory for exploring the astrophysics of black hole and testing prediction of Einstein general relativity. We relaxed the assumption that such a star supermassive black hole is described by Einstein theory and quantify possible deviation. Our findings from this new measurement of such a star provide further evidence that astrophysical supermassive black hole independent of their mass are described by solution of Einstein theory. For such a star, as we found for M87, inferred size of the black hole shadow is consistent with the prediction of general relativity within the 10%. This consistency is in spite of the fact that such a star and M87 are feeding on matter at dramatically different rates, with such a star accreting one million times less matter. So our conclusion indicate that Einstein theory is still holding strong. And in addition of what was observed for M87, now we have the most compelling evidence to date that the supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy is a black hole, and that it is in all likelihood described by Einstein theory. We know black hole, and in particular, the vicinity of the event horizon, are becoming an obs observational test bed for gravitational physics. This environment offers us the unique opportunity to determine where and how Einstein theory break down. And if it does, of course, we transform our understanding of gravity and the property of space and time. We know very well that the idea of testing 
Einstein theory using our galactic center, black hole, is not new. But the result we have shared today represents an important step forward. So I'm delighted to be able to say that we have finally imaged the supermassive black hole at the heart of our galaxy. These measurements have opened a new window onto studying black hole and their role, their central role in our universe. The years ahead, of course, we transform our understanding of black hole and the fundamental nature of gravity. So stay tuned because the best is yet to come. Now, I will hand over to my colleague Ando, Anton, who will give the closing remark. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is it. This is a big, no, it is a huge moment for everyone in the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. It's the next level. And I'm proud of everyone of our entire worldwide team. They have worked so hard for this latest breakthrough. You are the first to see our image of the black hole in the center of our galaxy, as close as it gets. Imagine this. We have combined the world's greatest radio telescopes into one Earth-sized camera. To be honest, after doing this for 40 years, I'm still astonished each time we pull this off. Let's shine a spotlight on the European facilities within the EHT. And we begin with the ALMA Observatory. The Atacama Large Millimeter Array at 5,000 meters altitude in the Chilean desert. This was our game changer. Its sensitivity, because of its huge collecting area, was the difference in measuring the weakest signals. And the 30 meter antenna in Spain of Iran this has been our flagship for over two decades. It is essential for making the sharpest image. The APEX, the Atacama Pathfinder experiment in Chile, near Alma, is, is invaluable for precisely calibrating our signals. And the NOEMA, the Northern Extended Millimeter Array in the French Alps, with this huge collecting area and super sensitive receivers, has given a further boost to the EHT. And a supercomputer, our correlator, is a hub for the processing of the enormous data sets that are required to then extract our images. These facilities, which include the three largest antennas within the EHT and the support from our funders, yes, that's us, the taxpayers, are a sustainable foundation for the continued success of the EHT. And we acknowledge the support of the national funding agencies, of the European Research Council, and of the Commission. Now that said, in its DNA and by our design, the EHT is a truly global enterprise. Well over 300 scientists from over 20 countries, and add to that telescope designers, builders, engineers, technicians, and staff, their contributions are what the scientific co collaboration depends on. In 2019, a little over a century after Albert Einstein revealed his theory of relativity, and after decades of pioneering preparatory work, we presented the first image of a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy M87. Nobel Prize winning measurements by Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Genzel, and we're so happy, Reinhard, that you're with us. With their teams, they showed that there must be such a black hole in our galaxy. And we made this black hole visible for the first time. And it confirms their conclusions. So what about Einstein? Would he smile seeing all this, hundreds of scientists still not having proven him wrong? I rather think that he would be ecstatic seeing all the experimental possibilities we have in this field today. So, mission accomplished. Yes, but there's so much more to do. We now want to go on and make movies. We want to study magnetic fields. We want to look at the jets in galaxies. And yes, we want to tackle gravitation theory again. New antennas in the EHT, like NOEMA and the African Millimeter Telescope, 
and ever improving technology will enable to do to do will enable us to do that and much more so today we're celebrating the first image of the supermassive black hole in our galaxy and we're talking about what it tells us and why that matters and tomorrow we'll be back at work unraveling the mysteries of black holes in the universe thank you all for being with us today and now over to your questions Thank you to our speakers for sharing this remarkable result with us. It was lovely to hear from, I mean, as you saw there, our collaborators across Europe, um, from extremely bright 25 year old postdocs through to people that have been literally working on this and pioneering it for, um, well, uh, Anton Zenzis mentioned 40 years, but Thomas Crickbaum who spoke has been working on this for even longer than that. Um, really, you know, myself and Ian have been in p part of this wonderful collaboration, uh, myself for approximately eight years now, but this has been many, many decades in the, in, in the, in the running. And I'm sure you can see the, the elation there in some of my, um, my European colleagues. And it's been an absolute delight to work with them and learn from them, um, not only on the science and the technical aspects, but uh, what it is to be part of a, a large international team like that. So, so we've, 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 we've dealt with a formal part of, the, part of the proceedings. The intention now, just for the next few 15 minutes, if, if, we, if we get there by then, ah, oh, yeah, here is your black hole. We're flying through, we live in a, a galaxy that looks like a spiral, the Milky Way. We're inside towards the outskirts um, in galactic suburbia on the Earth here. And we have, as I said, telescopes on extreme sites in the world. Um, that uh, and and it's going to zoom in here on Hawaii, a 5,000 meter volcano on the Hawaiian Islands, um, and you can see these are very very hefty dishes. They were pointed at our galactic center back in 2017, April of 2017, and that's the Meerkat image that's taken of the region. And if you zoom in even further, that was what the Nobel Prize was given to for to Andrea Gez and Ranad Gonzal, monitoring stars over 40 years to prove that it was a black hole at the center and then the event horizon telescope revealing the first image of that black hole at our Milky Way center. Right, so I'm now, I, there, there, there might be a little bit of repetition but I, I hope that you appreciate that because the idea here again is really to have a slightly more detailed conversation and, and make sure that um, beyond the, the, the immediate results we, we get into a little bit more about how this all works. So the shadow concept I think was ex very very well explained but essentially you have remember photons um, particles of light deflected by a black hole and also capped by a black hole and the net result there is uh, what is predicted is this ring-like structure um, that 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 is the objective of uh, the EHT. What Sarah uh, Isurun really brought across was uh, and this is a lovely figure that kind of really illustrates the difference between the 2019 M87 black hole and that of the 27 uh, the, today's release of Sag J star is that they look incredibly similar. I mean, apart from the color scale, they're, they're very similar, similar objects, but a thousand, over a thousand times different in mass. And that's illustrated here by, you could, M87, there was an X, uh, XKCD uh, cartoon that basically showed that the ring could fit the entire solar system inside. There's Voyager 1 and Pluto's orbit. The difference here is you have to dive, you have to dive in there and you can fit Sagittarius A star's ring inside of Mercury's orbit. So these two things look the same on, on the sky. They're, they, they're pretty much the same, r roughly the same size uh, as, uh, um, on the sky, but in actual terms, they're a thousand times different, more than a thousand. And to kind of bring that home, this is an illustration that uh, those two, those, those red rings, imagine that's the M87 and Sagittarius star ring, that's how they appear on the sky, 
but M87 is sitting in 55 million light years away, whereas this is in our galactic home 27,000 light years away. And this illustration, this, this animation is just going to illustrate what happens if you were to bring M87's black hole all the way into our galaxy and put it at the exact same spot as Sagittarius A star. A different beast altogether. But, but that's the remarkable thing. They look incredibly similar. So, you know, general relativity predicts this, that it shouldn't be mass dependent what this, what this actually looks like. The ring size um, is determined by the mass and that should be what we call scale free. And that's the, the remarkable um, aspect of this, a completely different black, black hole on one end of the mass spectrum of black holes compared to M87 black hole, which is, a, is gargantuan, one of the, the most massive black holes in the universe that we know of. Uh, and yet you're seeing a very, very similar image. It's a, it's a startling um, consistency check of general relativity. So the two, this was mentioned, but I'll just, I'll just come back to it because I'm sure there'll be questions on it. The reason this was a lot harder than M87 uh, were twofold. Firstly, you can think of, e even though the plasma that's falling into these black holes is traveling close to the speed of light, both of, in both black holes, you can think of, the, of Sag A star, the smaller black hole, as being faster. Why do I say faster? Um, it's the analogy of to, um, I, I've got a three and a one year old, and if I'm trying to get them in a photograph together, well, it doesn't work. They move away c constantly. So try and do that for a, 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 in a very dark setting where you're trying to do a time lapse, <laughs> long exposure. That's the problem with Sag A star. Um, it's not going to stay in one place. The image, the, the structure of the ring changes while we're observing it. Um, so so it's, it, we had to invent completely new techniques to, to actually do this. And then the other aspect is you saw that we live inside of a spiral galaxy, a dislike galaxy. And if you think of a fried egg with the, the yolk at the middle, uh, we're out in the suburbia in the egg white, but we have to look through the egg white to the yolk to actually make an image of this black hole. And there's a lot of gas and dust and free electrons are the big problem that scatter and blur the, the, the ring-like feature. And that has to be accounted for in the imaging process uh, and in the calibration process. And that took a lot of effort to, to, to solve. So those are the two key challenges and why this was a, a lot more years in the effort to learn thing. Um, there was quite a bit of effort put into, uh, quite a lot of uh, noting from, from um, Christian from the, 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 the different black hole models. There is an enormous, incredibly talented team that simulates a whole, uh, a whole suite of black hole simulations. What's actually happening in the vicinity of a black hole? Um, you know, so you have um, plasma physics and you have a theory of relativity, uh, well, a theory of gravity, predominantly general relativity was used in these. Um, and you have an, an idea, a simulation of what's going on in the immediate vicinity. But now on top of that, remember the black hole bends the light. So the light that is uh, being emitted by the very, very hot plasma that you're seeing here spiraling in magnetic fields uh, is then gravitationally lensed. It's bent, uh, distorted. And what you're seeing here is a whole library of different properties, different simulations of black holes that are then gravitationally lensed you, you have the bending of the light around the black hole and that's why you see the deficit here and so and each of these has a different time evolution so um, what we can see here if this would work is the plasma orbiting around these but they, they all look qualitatively and if you get symmetric quantitatively different so our challenge is having a huge library of these and then comparing it with the image that we actually make to try and figure out what the real properties are. And so what this is trying to illustrate is you can start to rule out things based on what the, what the shadow looks like um, and you can um, slowly start to converge on what the properties of the black hole might, might actually be uh, in that vicinity. Um, in terms of what Vitz contributed here, so you, you now need to um, uh, and this is also the University of Pretoria, you, n you now need to uh, convert these, these snapshot images of what we think a black hole looks like um, 
remember the, the toddlers are moving around, so you have to actually average images together. And there's an average image over the duration of the entire observation, which is typically of order 8 to 12, to 12 hours. And then what we do is we, we generated a software suite that basically converts those perfect images as if you were right up close next to the black hole. Um, and we put it through the imperfections of our instrument and of the atmosphere and of the uh, inaccuracies of our algorithms, etc., or inef uh, inefficiencies of our algorithms. And you get out what a, a more realistic picture there. Now, that's critical because if you actually want to compare what you are measuring, what you are capturing um, with, with theoretical data, you, you have to actually understand your very well. So that was one of our contributions. The other contribution, this is not a slide for reading, just to give a sense of, uh, uh, this was Dr. Indian and Russia Ryan that really led this component of uh, uh, one of the papers in the, um, in the what that's being released today. Uh, he worked incredibly hard to basically do those comparisons. And on top of that, we spoke about how the shadow size is determined by the mass of the black hole. But that it doesn't necessarily mean that when you measure the, the radius of the bright emission around the black hole, that that's going to give you the shadow, the 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 the, 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 grav the black hole's event horizon size. You actually have to calibrate that out with simulations. And what Dr. Natarayan did um, very carefully was to use a whole number of algorithms to actually extract this information and compare it to what actually was the black hole. Um, uh, characteristic radius, as we call it, in 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 the simulation. So we can, he, he will be available for interviews, and he can give you um, an inside track of just how challenging a task this was that he under, that he led uh, for the HT in in, in um, extracting black hole parameters. Um, in the press pack, you will find uh, a profile on Dr. Notaran um, and and some lovely quotes. He unfortunately couldn't be here today. That's a that's a great pity, but. Um, yeah, you can definitely have uh, interviews with them after the fact. Um, so, I often get the question, how is this linked to the to the SKA? Um, well, you know, our involvement here was not, it, it's not, it, it's not completely um, random that we were part of the EHT. We were part of the EHT because we had value to offer, and that was leveraged off of all the uh, de um, development and expertise that have been built up around the Meerkat and Square Kilometer Array projects. So those are big projects, but there are a whole lot of knock-on effects. You build up expertise in the country that enable you to then uh, participate in and invest in other experiments around the world. And this was one particular example in the case of Indian and myself. So this is the one of the Meerkat dishes of the 64 sitting in the Karoo. Um, this, this telescope, uh, this antenna operates at a frequency about a hundred times lower that, than that of the EHT. So it cannot participate in EHT observations. It, 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 it's, instead of looking like a mirror, the surface of the antenna looks more like sandpaper for one, and the receivers aren't sensitive to that one millimeter of light. They're closer to about 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters of light. So that's, that's why it doesn't participate. But it doesn't mean that we can't use many of the techniques uh, and, in, and in fact, that's that's what triggered me to start developing that software suite that we contributed to the to the HD back in 2014. So um, the other reason it's connected is this is you might remember Meerkat's inauguration. They released this beautiful uh, image taken by Meerkat, um, produced by Meerkat, of the galactic center, the very region we've just been talking about this whole EHT press conference. And you know this was. Um, uh, lauded by many, uh, uh, two, two prominent examples being there. Um, to give you a sense of scale on this image that you might remember, so that's the apparent scale of the moon in the sky um, on that image. And the image you've just seen today, as you heard from Sarah, is the apparent size of a donut on the moon, right in the center there. So this is our, this is our galactic home, the center of our galaxy and an incredibly important laboratory for, for understanding a whole range of astrophysics, um, but as you heard as well, for precision tests, tests of general relativity. Um, this is an updated image by um, Professor Ian Hayward at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's a long-time collaborator of mine. He was actually a, a mentor of mine during my PhD there. Uh, but just a beautiful image. So I've shown you a lot of scales. I just want to summarize it in this figure, which was produced by Sarah, actually. Um, I thought it was, yes, it was Sarah. So 
you've got the South Pole Telescope here, uh, which is just one of the sites that participates in these observations. I love that. Um, pointed towards the uh, Sagittarius A star, uh, the Sagittarius constellation. Um, you've seen a meerkat image here, which is roughly 500 light years. Sorry, 500 light years. Um, inside there is something known as the Galactic uh, Center Mini Spiral. The Nobel Prize was awarded for this work of tracking stars orbiting the galactic center, um, uh, and that scale is around 70 light days. They were tracking orbits for uh, decades. And then the image here, which is, and the scale there is three light minutes. So huge scales, absolutely huge scales that are involved in studying black holes um, and, and the phenomena around. Now, we're not 100% confident of, um, it, it seems like there's star formation that's driving some of these outflows, and these are old exploded stars. Um, but still, Meerkat will continue to study the, the, the galactic center for other reasons, trying to search for um, spinning neutron stars. But that's a subject of a whole nother talk. Okay, I'm going to close out just with a few comments on African expansion of the Event Horizon Telescope. You heard a little bit about this from um, uh, EHD board member Anton Zenzis. Um, but if you look at this, I mean, you can't see, you can see that um, there's a gap in the network and it's, and it's the African continent. And it's particularly important in the case of Sagittarius A star because that's in our southern, southern sky. It basically passes directly above us. It's the one of the reasons that the meerkat image of the, the galactic center was so good is because it passed almost directly above us. So really, we're, we're, if, if we want to go on to these precision tests of general relativity, we're really looking at expanding the, the, the EHT into Africa, and particularly Southern Africa, to see that, 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 that view. Um, so you know, the dream is really to look towards the galactic center and to be able to make these kinds of movies that were, were mentioned um, in, in, in the um, Munich press conference. So you can see on the spinning earth here, there are, I'll have to play it again, you can see there are several sites on here. Um, and it's not just, it's not, it's not that you need huge dishes, you just need a piece of, of mirror somewhere there in order to ensure that you improve the imaging quality so as to do these kinds of tests. Hmm. So you, you heard about the Africa Millimeter Telescope. So this is a proposed 15-meter um, dish. It's relocating this dish, which is currently in Chile, um, to the top of Mount Kampsberg. Um, this is me standing right there after the scariest 4x4 trip of my entire life. Um, but the proposed site is up here. It's 2,300 meters, um, about an hour away from Pintuk. But we're also looking at a low-cost South African station. Um, now, the reason I say low-cost is because, excuse a few bullet points rather than all the images I've been throwing at you, but in South Africa, we, we really have um, a number of extremely well-established sites with really good infrastructure. Um, where, you know, and the Meerkat, Neske, and, and, uh, and Sutherland are the two prominent examples. Um, but we also have world-class telescope engineering expertise. Um, on mass, into, into, in, in, having gone into Meerkat and having um, being prepared for the, the square kilometer array, so a, sw a small diameter, like of order ten meters, slight, maybe even smaller, um, that is located somewhere in southern Africa, about a thousand kilometers from the African Millimeter Telescope, will be incredibly powerful for a number of reasons. The African Telescope would be very isolated. So in what we call calibration, but ensuring that your measurements are, are um, robust, you need some redundancy. And the 1,000 kilometer baseline is very important for seeing that fluffier emission. Um, and then there's also kind of weather. If the weather's bad over one site, you, you still capture. So, so there are several reasons why there's a, there's a very compelling case. And, and the key thing here is a, a low cost version, smaller dish at a, a well-established site that can be produced, uh, uh, commissioned fairly quickly. Um, but yeah, the, the emphasis here, as you heard in the, in the Munich, Munich press conference, is really that we need as many of these antennas as possible if we're going to take this precision black hole imaging to, to, to the next stage and be doing um, really, really precision tests of general relativity. Right, so I'll just make the final point that, of course, that sort of development is completely synergistic 
with what is going on in the continent already. Centered in the Karoo, the Meerkat Array, 64 dishes, that'll be expanded to a slightly larger array in partnership with the Max Planck Society um, uh, and ENOUGH in, in Italy. And then um, the, the great dream to expand that uh, to the rest of uh, the African continent. So this is completely synergistic for a whole range of scientific and technical and practical reasons. So um, I really hope in the future that we can welcome you all back into the planetarium as an upgraded digital dome the Dean of Science mentioned our, our, great, our, our ongoing project to upgrade this to a digital dome and, a, and a, uh, an incredible facility um, and fly you through the Milky Way um, en route to the Galactic Center and show you Event Horizon telescope images and movies of the black hole in our own galaxy. With that, I'll say thank you very much and open it to questions. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, do you want to come in? It's maybe, sh should we do maybe five minutes of questions and then go in? Um, we've got some online questions. We do. Okay. Let's maybe do 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen a hand yet. Um, cool. Maybe, maybe press first because we can chat in, <laughs> in the office. So the, the black hole actually bends light, any light that's passing through it. So it, it wouldn't matter where you were looking from, you would see the ring structure. It bend on the orientation, the, 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 the direction in which it's spinning. So there is an inclination effect, but you will always see a ring-like feature. It doesn't matter, the light is actually bending around the black hole. So you're not looking at the top, the side, you're looking at hot, hot gas that is shining red hot and all the light is being bent around the black hole from all sides. Now there might be preferred directions and things, but you're seeing it being bent around. So you can see at the back of the black hole. Do we know what's happening inside yet? No one seems to come back. No, I mean, there's, you know, we postulate about whether it might be a singularity or just um, uh, something else until we get someone coming back. Uh. <laughs> Shall I go, with it? go for it. We've got an online question from um, Elsa B. Brits from the Daily Maverick, and she asks, uh, can you please explain the influence of the black hole, um, uh, the influence that the black hole has on our galaxy? Um, is it very active or not? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll premise that with one of the interesting findings over the last 20, 25 years in astronomy is that somehow black holes know about their galaxies or galaxies know about their black holes. But the size disparity is enormous. Um, it shouldn't be, basically, um, if you just look at gravitational effects. So, sure, uh, LCB in the immediate vicinity of Sagittarius A star, um, it, it you saw those S2 stars that were orbiting around it. It completely, it, the gravitational field of the black hole dominates those, those stars. But as soon as you start to move away, um, a little bit further away, at some point the gravitational influence of the nearby stars um, and gas dominates over the black hole. So it's actually a very small region that it does dominate. However, uh, and this is linked to the, 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 the influence that somehow these, these, these black holes know about each other. You have all sorts of energetic phenomena, as you've seen, um, that, are, that, that are happening in that vicinity. And sometimes you have relativistic jets, jets that are close to the speed of light being launched from that black hole. And there's so much energy involved in this that that can actually influence the growth of the black hole. So a, a, a rough kind of scale that I often use is um, about a millimeter pinprick in the middle of the football field, uh, soccer field just behind this planetarium can basically determine the rate at which the grass grows on that entire field. Um, we're still figuring out why that is, but it's definitely related to what we call feedback, where these energetic processes, both from the black hole and the star formation, uh, influence things. Another question. Can you explain gravity in, in the black hole? <laughs> in the black hole? Yes. Um, 
how does gravity work around the black hole? Uh, it, it, I think that's the beautiful thing here, right? So um, you have two black holes that are a thousand times different mass. And the, the theory of gravity that's used to predict um, uh, what that ring size would be, uh, general relativity, predicts exactly, th th we, we get the right answer. So the, the, one of the, the major results here is that um, it seems that the general relativity is indeed right, that, that, that gravity is, is mass free. So, I mean, that influence is just a force on anything else that has a mass. But here we've shown with Sag A star and M87 alongside one another that essentially th that seems to be scale free across a thousand, uh, a thousand meters. And remember that example of a donut and the size of an entire stadium in Munich. Okay. Um, Edwin Naidu from University World News. What does this uh, project mean for the development of space science in Africa? Well, th that's th that's an interesting question. I mean, at the moment, it's just two of us on African soil involved in this incredibly exciting project. But I think it's clear that just just what the two of us have offered is is, is incredibly valuable. Um, apart from that, we have and a geographic advantage. So I would say, yes, there are synergies alongside what we're already doing, not just Indian and I, but, but the, uh, the, the radio astronomy and broader astronomy community in South Africa. But I think the real excitement there is if we actually get um, you know, a stake in the game and, 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 and host a station of the EHT, because that spurs all kinds of development um, around those scientific fields. I mean, black hole imaging, they were saying, is just th we're just at the start of black hole imaging. There is so much wonderful science. This is a field that's just opening up. Um, I, think, I think it's a huge growth area if we, if we want to capture it as a, as a community. Thanks. Um, then we've got one from Munya Razi Amakoni. He's writing for, um, I think it's for Physics World, he says. And he said, I ask, can you please um, uh, uh, explain um, the low cost South African station? Um, has it been approved? What will its role be? Who will fund it? No, this is in an, this is in an early stage. Um, and it's linked to several, I didn't have time to go into it, but several technological advancements and a few scientific results that you'll see that are, that are still embargoed will be coming out soon. Um, but essentially, um, the, the idea, it, it's still very much in a concept phase, um, but driven, motivated by these technological investments. So one of these is the Korean VLBI network, very long baseline interferometry. The Koreans have produced this uh, um, simultaneous receivers that allow you to essentially, you don't have to go to the extreme site. You can come to a lower site because of the design of the hardware on the, on the telescope. Um, so that is one example where suddenly that means that if you think, if you imagine, you know, the altitude of the earth and suddenly you, you drop it by a thousand meters, that means a whole lot of other uh, sites are, are in place. And what that means is a lot of the cost of these experiments and, and building, establishing sites is infrastructure. It's, it's, it's actually roads and power. So if you can go to a site that already has roads, power, um, and uh, astro, uh, astro engineers trained that are, that are there, um, well, you drop your project costs by uh, uh, sometimes orders of magnitude. So what we're here, what we're doing at the moment is an exploratory um, uh, study on, you know, to, to what extent can we go, can we pursue this? Um, and the idea is very much to leverage off that 15 meter African millimeter telescope that's in Namibia. And you know this is directly linked to what what used to be called the African VLBI network, um, and linking different African countries. And we might be able to do this in a in a, in a low cost way. Um, the last two that I've got here. Um, can uh, how are black holes named? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good question. You've you've seen M eighty seven star and Sagittarius A star. Um, so so the history of that is Sagittarius A star. Um, it's Sagittarius A um, because it's the brightest radio source in the Sagittarius constellation. So A, and then the next one would be B, C, and the star is that it's peculiar, um, <laughs> which basically means it's uh, it's got non-thermal properties. And, but yeah, so that's the that's the origin there. Um, yeah, the 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 M87 um, M87 star black hole was named in Hawaii, um, Poe. 
and there was a there was a push to rename this one as well, but they decided to leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then can you just elaborate on the tran the uh, transformation of the planetarium into a digital dome? What would the difference be? Um, would it still um, feel like a planetarium? Would it still have the same functions? Um, no, it will be a a a, a dramatically transformed facility. This beautiful projector just behind me, uh, parts of which are 90 years old, will unfortunately have to be moved out. Uh, we'll be very sad about that, but extremely excited about the new opportunity that this brings. So it'll be a fully digital system. Um, we will have new comfortable seats uh, inclined. And the, the key idea here is that it'll become a multidisciplinary facility. I'm, a, I'm an astronomer, I love astronomy, but uh, we would want to see a whole host of um, disciplines using this theater and, and, and the digital content production laboratory that we'll, we'll produce alongside this. So, you know, anything from particle physics through to um, studying lightning, climate change models, um, you know, I, I think the key thing here is that we live in a data rich world uh, where um, in most fields are being driven by big data science and visualization if you immerse yourself in those kinds of data sets, you don't necessarily just immediately write papers and, and learn things, but you gain intuition in a way that is very difficult if you're not immersing yourself. So we're very excited about turning this into a multidisciplinary um, facility, welcoming the public and continuing to have our, our almost 100,000 school learners pass through a year. And, um, and of course, the, the, I think the secret source is that this is located on a university. The interface with the uh, leading researchers is right here. Um, and again, if that's climate science through to, through to um, uh, particle physics. All right. Well, I would like now to invite Professor Dina Naidu, who is the head of School of Physics, um, who will close proceedings. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the press, colleagues, um, and also want to thank uh, Professor Nithya Chetty, who is the Dean of Science, who welcomed the event. And of course, my good friend and DVC, Professor Ian Jindrell, uh, spent a lot of time um, enjoying the presentation, so thank you, Ian. Um, and I'll also, first of all, like to congratulate Roger Dean and also his postdoc, Natarajan. So a round of applause, please. I remember clearly, I mean, Roger asked me to say a few words. I actually do not know what to speak about, but I could take this floor right till cocktails till five, but I'll try to keep it sharp. So Roger first joined, and it was a huge initiative to move him from UP as part of the Kauteng Research Triangle. A lot of information went into that, but when he came to my office prior to taking the appointment, he says, Dina, I've got something to tell you in the next few months, there'll be a discovery. That was 2019, the first discovery, and he kept to his promise. The after he came to me, he says, we need to employ this postdoc, Dr. Nadarajan, in a very short space of time, under different, different conditions during the COVID period. So I got onto that with Roger and all the research office, and there you have the influence of two South Africans as part of the, these discoveries. So thank you, Roger, and thank you to bring the contribution for Wits University. I hope this translates into some huge prize and hopefully a Nobel Prize and you could be part of it. Okay, so that's great news. So, yeah, I think in terms of the School of Physics, um, we're very proud of all researchers, in particular when there's major discoveries. And I'm sure the DVC research, our VC, who is a physicist also, is very proud. At the moment, as many of you have seen the news, he's just been inducted into the Royal Society uh, of UK, which is brilliant also for physicists. So that's very important. So physicists are flying the flag I at Wits University, sorry, DVC, who is engineer. So, yeah, so, so in terms of astronomy and astrophysics in the department, it's been a long history in the school. Uh, from previous ads, moving on with the times, employing people, 
we built a fairly strong astronomy and astrophysics group with some issues and passing away of people we start rebuilding and I think by end of this year we'll have a full core of strong or one of the strongest research groups in astronomy and astrophysics that spans the event horizon telescope and its discovery with the supermassive uh, uh, black hole discovery the galactic center but our research extends much more than that we have s collaboration in Namibia within uh, the university we also have uh, collaborations with Italy we also have collaborations with Meerkat we have collaborations obviously in the future for the next tens and tens of years with SKA projects which will be commencing soon in the next years and we just employed another professor in radio astronomy who joins on the 8th of July to build on observational radio astronomy so we are very strong certainly we want to build it's been an initiative through the, the northern part of the country to build radio astronomy strong compared to the guys closer to the Meerkat and SK in the south so thank you Roger for, for all the work and your team and also we have an institute we formulated very very quickly it was always there but never conceptualized so Roger is a chair and I have other colleagues involved and Chen Nukri present today so we're looking very strong in that region but I have to showcase physics it's just not astronomy and astrophysics it's a school of physics we also have some super research areas and super researchers we have uh, research uh, spanning theoretical physics from string theory, sync theory to cosmology and so on, condensed matter physics, our energy physics associated with a large project at CERN and so on and so on, including energy uh, uh, research, etc. So we're very proud of the School of Physics. Now, why the planetarium? The planetarium was initially run through some central entity at the university and it was given to the School of Physics as part of our umbrella responsibilities. Now, this is the planet. You may have brought your kids here. You must have brought your brothers and sisters for shows. Okay? Which has been the main function as an outreach facility. Now, Professor Chetty and Professor Dean have spoken a little bit about digitalization of the planetarium. This is going to change the landscape of the university as an iconic, not just iconic centenary project, but iconic facility showcasing Wits University from the from the highway across eventually in time. So I think the question was asked one of the news reporters, Roger tried to answer it. Um, yes, it's going to be a multidisciplinary. We have started this exercise already about a year now with Roger and a working team that crosses engineering the data science people, the arts, the fine arts, and including maybe we go across the L sciences and wherever partners we can get. So yes, it's under the School of Physics, but it's a university project. So it'll be a hub, like Roger said, for research, visualization, but also an hub for postgraduate training, which is one of the remits of the university to expand on postgraduate students. This is one part of the expansion. I have a task together with my team next week and of course with the, the contractors to demolish all this art. Okay, that's phase one. But we will still run special shows up until then and including the big announcements in September. So we have other wings across here. We'll make this with offices, post centers, entertainment areas. So it's going to be a big deal. So I'm speaking very proudly because I have the DVC here and they have to fund some parts of the project. So yes, this is going to be completely a new ball game. Projectors all over. The resolutions you see on this roof is going to be completely different, like Prof. Chetty said. It's going to be spectacular. And I hope I'm still here to see it uh, as HOD or even as an academic. So I think Prof. General, we did the inauguration of <coughs> one of the first people in space that he got captivated by with this current system okay we need to relocate this beast in the next few weeks which we will sort out but i'm very very proud of our researchers the school of physics 
And once again, thank you for participating in this event and all those who are online, in particular the news reporters. So thank you, Roger, for, for the event and thank you for all the colleagues uh, from the planetarium for setting this up. So thank you and I think, Roger, it's, we can go out there for cocktails and drinks. Thank you, guys. Thank you.